you. Thank you so much, Sue. We are again so grateful to partner with Reconciliation to commemorate Sa'igu as we did together five years ago uh, for the 25th anniversary. It really is an honor to get to do this work um, together. And thanks to all of you. It's always fun to scroll through the, the gallery and see who ha has all joined us tonight. Thanks very much uh, for taking part of your Friday evening um, to be with us. Um, and of course, we want to uh, give greetings and hope all of you had a wonderful Earth Day today. We Christians have just come through Holy Week and Easter. And we often forget that in Luke's story, the raucous Palm Sunday parade celebrating the hope of new possibilities concludes with Jesus breaking down in bitter wailing as he overlooks the city of Jerusalem. Jesus both sees the violence of injustice within the city and foresees the violence that would eventually come upon it from without. So we wanna start out our short presentation tonight by recalling that painful and poignant gospel moment and how it so profoundly illuminates our own history here in Los Angeles, because we too are a city that does not fully recognize the things that make for peace. As Daniela said, one week from today, we commemorate the 30th anniversary of the beginning of the Los Angeles uprising, the largest civil disturbance in the history of the United States, and an urban rebellion that had a huge impact on all of Los Angeles's communities. So we gather to remember this history and its legacy mindful of our mentor Vincent Harding's wisdom that all social movements of liberation begin with memory. We do this in order to face unresolved traumas which shape the continuing landscape of injustice today in the City of Angels, and because we are still haunted by the personal and political violence that gave rise to Sa'igu. To frame tonight's conversation, we want to draw on a key idea of our recent book on decolonization entitled Healing Haunted Histories, and that is so poignantly recontextualized in Heyoon Song's art here, which we'll hear more about um, a little bit later. UC Santa Barbara sociologist Avery Gordon in her 1997 book, Ghostly Matters, asserts that haunting is a constituent element of modern social life through which repressed or unresolved social violence makes itself known in everyday life, especially when they're supposedly over and done with, slavery, for instance, or when their oppressive nature is continuously denied. Gordon also emphasizes how reckoning, reckoning with these ghosts can mobilize individual, social, or political movement and change, but only as our hauntings are faced and healed. To illustrate what is meant here, we need to look no further than the murder of George Floyd by a Minneapolis policeman almost two years ago, which again, Daniela has already invoked. As you are all aware, <clears throat> This brought up yet again the ghosts of a long-standing history of violence toward black and brown bodies in our white dominant American body politic. This powerful haunting spread across time and space, even as far away as war-torn Syria, but also as close as Los Angeles. The protests against Floyd's murder and ongoing police violence erupted as well bringing back, quote, the ghosts of Rodney King and Watts, as the New York Times put it. In a similar vein, just over a month ago, we commemorated the one year anniversary of the horrible murders of eight people, six of whom were Asian American women in the Atlanta spa shootings. 
Our American landscape is indeed full of ghosts, especially those lingering from centuries of racism. This is why it is important to take time to remember, to reassess, and to renew our commitment to healing and restorative solidarity. So let us recap the origins of Sa'igu. On March 3rd, 1991, Rodney King, an African-American motorist, was pulled over by Los Angeles police officers after leading them on a high-speed chase. Once pulled out of the car and put on the ground, King was beaten severely by four officers. A bystander famously videotaped much of the incident from a distance. Over a year later, on April 29, 1992, a jury in a Simi Valley court composed of, quote, 10 whites, one Hispanic, and one Asian. After seven days of testimony and deliberation, acquitted three of the officers and hung on one of the charges for the fourth. Within hours, riots went off around Los Angeles County and spread to other cities around the country. And over the course of four days, 63 people lost their lives amid the looting and fires that ravaged the city. 10 were shot to death by law enforcement officials. An additional 44 people died in other homicides or incidents tied to the uprising. 14 were white. Two were Asian, a Vietnamese and a Korean, 28 were black, and 19 were Latinx. The uprising destroyed or damaged over 1,000 buildings in the LA area. Approximately 3,600 fires were set with fire calls coming once every minute at some points. The estimated cost of the damages was over 1 billion. Some 9,800 California National Guard troops were deployed to take control of the situation. Three days after the violence began, federal troops from the 7th Infantry Division and the United States Marines from the 1st Marine Division were also sent in. Soldiers stayed in some areas of LA for almost a month. Nearly 12 people were arrested, mostly directed, directly related to the rioting. The violence particularly impacted the Korean community in Los Angeles, though widely ignored by the press. A part of the story that uh, Reconciliation and ourselves and some others focused on five years ago in our commemoration. As a young activist, I was on the streets of Northwest Pasadena with the We Care Community Coalition during the violence, trying to keep the peace while working for justice, using the now famous slogan of the uprising, a slogan that echoes Jesus' lament over Jerusalem about knowing the things that make for peace. But 1992 was the second time many of us had seen our city burn because Los Angeles, a city of angels, is also a city of ghosts. The first time was August 11th to the 15th, 1965, when LA burned for three days in reaction, to see if this sounds familiar, to the beating of a black man by white cops after a routine traffic stop. I was 10 years old at the time. I can still remember the acrid smell in the air. During the Watts Rebellion, 35 people were killed, 900 injured, and property losses were at a quarter of a billion dollars. Okay. Federal troops were called in to occupy our city then, too. One of a string of summer urban riots throughout the decade, Watts 1965 became a national symbol for black unrest and white suppression. It reminded the nation, if only for a moment, of the inevitable violence that sooner or later erupts when and where justice is lacking. A few days after Martin Luther King Jr. came to town and was deeply moved by the conversations he had here about systemic civil rights violations, economic injustice, and racial discrimination. A riot, King said famously, is the language of the unheard. 
But the roots and hauntings go even deeper in this city. Beneath the soil and concrete of Los Angeles are three broad layers of history. First, thousands of years of indigenous sovereignty and flourishing. Then, the history of European conquest and colonization, beginning with the violence and displacement during the Spanish and Mexican period from 1769 to 1846. And then the third layer is the last 175 years of American domination, industrial development, and forced assimilations of peoples. These strata often look like this image, San Andreas Fault, which shows tortured bends and twists due to tectonic forces. This symbolizes the traumatic labyrinth that marginalized people have to navigate to survive. And we'll give brief examples from this stratigraphy of hauntings. Spanish colonization brought disease, forced labor, habitat loss, and cultural repression for the indigenous Tongva communities of the place we now call Southern California, facilitated in large part by the mission system. This Holocaust has recently been documented by native scholar Elias Castillo's work, published as a counter to the canonization of Father Serra by the Catholic Church. There was resistance, most famously from the Tongva medicine woman Toy Rina, whose image haunts this wall in East LA today. And of course, the Tongva still survive among us and are rebuilding their culture. And there's another haunting. The first group of pobladores, colonists, who came up from Mexico to settle what they called El Pueblo de Nuestra Señora La Reina de Los Angeles sobre el Rio de la Porciuncala, were in fact a very diverse group. One mestizo, two negros, eight mulatos, nine indios, and only two European Spaniards. So from its beginnings, Los Angeles exhibited multicultural roots as celebrated in Judy Baca's mural here. But over the ensuing two and a half centuries, we have not nearly fully realized this promise. Quite the opposite. After California was taken over by Americans, it was heavily marketed to Eastern white folks and its population began to double every decade. So by 1930, city fathers boasted LA as the whitest, most Protestant city in the United States. We're looking at a tourist map of Los Angeles from 1940. The smaller legend in the middle lists the quote, foreign col colonies in the city, including Negro, Chinese, Korean, Filipino, Russian, Jewish, Italian, Mexican, Indian, Serb, and Czechoslovakian neighborhoods, so that wasps could avoid these dangerous communities. Many neighborhoods routinely practiced attaching restrictive housing covenants to property deeds. Highland Park, where we used to live, once posted no Asian signs at the border of the town. And South Pasadena, where I grew up, prohibited Blacks and Mexicans from residing there for decades. In LA, class and race apartheid was also reinforced by decades of redlining, the practice of banks refusing to do mortgage lending in certain neighborhoods, which was even mandated by certain federal loan programs, as indicated in this 1935 FHA document. If you were Mexican, you simply couldn't live west of the LA River, hence East LA is still synonymous with Latino culture. If you were Black, similarly, you didn't cross north of Adams. And there were both official and unofficial initiatives that enforced such racist, racist codes, such as the infamous so-called Zoot Suit Riot during World War II, in which white servicemen roamed Echo Park beating up Mexicans. Or <clears throat> the internment of Japanese Americans. Today, LA is the sixth most segregated city in the United States. 
and here's yet another ghost. LA used to have one of the best public transportation systems in the US. But beginning in the 1930s, it began to be steadily dismantled by federal and city managers and oil and automobile interests, which conspired to re-engineer LA's social architecture into the car culture that it is today. Astrid Car ran in 1961, and particularly hard hit was the Watts neighborhood, where many working folk couldn't get to work anymore, contributing directly to the uprising several years later. During that same era, so-called urban redevelopment functioned to clear out poor neighborhoods from the city core. Meanwhile, the city was reconstructed on a massive freeway grid to accommodate cars commuting for white collar workers from increasingly far flung suburbs. Freeways like the 5, 10, and the 105 were rammed right through poor communities, dividing and destroying them. Transportation apartheid in LA continued to deepen after the Watts uprising, with the managerial class commuting by car, the middle class by a new but limited light rail network, and the working class poor by a deteriorating and crowded bus system. Sweet Alice Harris was a community organizer based in Watts since the 1950s. I met her at a 25th anniversary forum on the Watts riots in 1990. At one point, she was asked why the riots broke out in 1965. Because the cup of oppression just kept filling up, she said, and it finally overflowed. And then she looked out and said, and it's filling up again, and it's about to overflow again. And sure enough, less than two years after that prophecy in 1992, Los Angeles did burn again. This is what happens when we don't look deep enough into the soil of our history to learn the stratigraphy of injustice from generation to generation. The hauntings just keep returning. So we close with a quote from another wise African-American elder of blessed memory, poet Maya Angelou. History, she wrote decades ago, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. And that, friends, is why we've gathered this weekend, to heal our hauntings by facing, facing our ghosts, with courage, working for gospel justice right here on Tongva land in order to realize that multicultural promise seated along the banks of the Rio Ponciuncala. So we have three panelists tonight and we have cited Avery Gordon's argument that haunting is a constituent element of modern social life through which repressed or unresolved social violence makes itself known in everyday life, especially when their oppressive nature is continuously denied. But Gordon also asserts that reckoning with these ghosts can mobilize individual, social, or political movement and change. And so we want to put before you three related questions. One, what ghosts of past or present oppression did you and or your family carry when you arrived in Los Angeles? Two, what ghosts did you encounter here in the haunted landscapes of Los Angeles? And how has this helped you understand Saigu? And third, how have your experiences of facing these hauntings helped animate the work for restorative solidarity? So Sue, we will turn it over to you. Hmm. And before we shift to the panelists, I wanted us to take a deep breath because um, 
I think these images and these quotes may have stirred some things in our bodies. And, and as we are talking about all these things, all these hauntings, um, I wonder if how your body has been reacting. Um, I could feel uh, my gut <laughs> kind of uh, shaking and feeling something deep. Um, I feel my shoulders and the weight of it feeling a little bit heavier. And so just be aware of um, how you, your body and your emotions are responding as we continue to have this difficult, courageous conversation together. And before we uh, kind of shift to our panelists, I wanted us to pay attention to an art piece that our staff, uh, an artist, Hei Yoon Song has created for this event that I wanted to um, share with you. She cannot be with us today, um, but she wanted to share um, her, her artwork. And so Daniela, would you mind sharing this? Thank you so much. And I'll read what she has, um, what she was trying to capture with this very difficult um, call to heal and to also um, name our hauntings. And so she wrote, this poster is dedicated to Saigu, an event that many communities, bodies, land, and city um, at, at an unease. I wanted to defy the dominant perspective of this, this event that left a mark on many lives and to use dichotomies between the past and present, visible and invisible, and reality and mythology to evoke many perspectives from those who witnessed and heard. The image of this poster was interpreted as black and white silhouettes who linger in the landscape of Los Angeles. She said, I wanted to use this fundamentals of stenciling technique in screen printing using positive and negative spaces to bridge the material and conceptual narratives. The figures who remain as white silhouettes, the cutouts from the black curtain backdrops are subjects drawn from images of the LA uprising. So these cutouts are actual images that she saw from photographs of the uprising. It was important to blur the lines between the imagery that will be perceived as those who are running away or running towards something. While the figures of the past exist in the shadows of escaping towards prospect and hope, the figures in the back, you see the black silhouettes, are many voices of activism triggered by the current unrest and showed up to protest and remember this day. So this is how she connects the the past and the present. What's also intriguing is this typeface of the font that she used um, that is called Martin on the top and Marsha at the bottom, both from the vocal type designed by an African-American designer, Trey Seals. The font Martin is named after Martin Luther King Jr and was specifically inspired by the poster that many of us are familiar with, I Am A Man. So it is the same font from that poster from the Memphis sanitation strike in 1968. Marsha, the, the print um, beneath, um, is named after the African-American transgender woman, Marsha P. Johnson, who is prominent for her activism in the Stonewall um, uprising of 1968. These two typefaces are nonviolent, but bear stories of the African American past and introduce minority culture and design. She also wanted to um, talk about trauma through this. If you can see at the bottom, uh, this uprootedness, right? This replanting um, and being traumatized in this replanting in a new land for many of us immigrants. And so she had put those roots to symbolize that. And even though maybe we were running away from something that there is still remnant of hope that we want to bear witness to. So um, these are the many <laughs> beautiful interpretation. And I'm sure that as you are um, seeing this, that you will also uh, see new things that um, that you may not have that she may not have even mentioned. So we wanted to just honor um, her art as well as um, the integral 
uh, piece of of healing comes through art, as many of us know. And so I wanted to recognize her art as well as many artists of past and present that continues to be um, continues to heal us and um, prophesy of things that have been and can be. So thank you. Thank you, Heyoon. Now um, we have we have the honor to uh, listen to our panelists today. Um, we wanted to just also note that uh, Stanley Green was supposed to be here and he cannot be here, unfortunately. He's in a wonderful retreat camp in Camp Friesenwald, is that how I say it? Um, and they have very limited um <laughs> internet connection and so um and she he's there for a retreat for to to be with other pastors and so um that was something that we were not prepared for until and we found out uh but uh, and so i know some of us wanted to really hear his interpretation and his story today but um we're just really grateful that we have uh the reverend dr david moore here with us um, he is an ecumenical teacher and author, the lead pastor of New Covenant Worship Center and the Jesus Collective. Uh, he had earned his master's degree from St. Stephen's University in New Brunswick, Canada, and holds his theology of um, doctorate from the University of South Africa. And so um, David is here, and I think he has some stories to share as well. And he, he joins us from the land of the Chumash people. Uh, he's married to Diane and have been married for 38 years, maybe more um, since the last time that I've heard and has five adult children. We also want to welcome um, our lovely Daniela Lazara Manalo, who, who introduced and opened our time for us. She serves as the Racial Equity Education and Advocacy Coordinator for Mennonite Central Committee. Some of you may have um, are familiar not only with the organization and may have heard uh, about her new role. And today you get to, you had the opportunity to meet her. Um, she's passionate about racial justice, equity, community mobilization and the multiple interdisciplinary understanding of identity formation in the US. And Daniela um, lives in Los Angeles with her husband and her beautiful son. And my name is Sue Parker. This is a late introduction. Um, I work for the Mennonite Church as the director of racial ethnic engagement this is a new title for me so uh, i have to get used to this and i co-direct reconciliation a peace center here in los angeles and um, next year marks our 10th year anniversary as a peace center so we celebrate that as well the three of us come from different places um, but we wanted to share our stories as um, from an intergenerational interracial perspective because our stories were not told well 30 years ago and our stories continue to be silenced and so and marginalized and so we wanted to create space where our voices and our stories could be heard so i will begin by reflecting on some of the pertinent questions that elaine and ched has given um, to us so the coast of past and present that our family carried with us. Um, Ma, I was born in South Korea in Seoul. Um, but this ghost um, is one uh, that goes before I was born. Um, my father was 17 when the Korean War broke out and um, he was 17 years old, so he was at the very, very young age and the minimal age to to take up arms and to fight um, really his brothers and sisters from a different um, from the same land. Right. And him being a gentle man, um, this had an impact on him to see so much violence when he was so young. And so. Um, my father later on we found out later much later we, when we had the words of true haunting um, he had ptsd 
and um, this unresolved war, this forgotten war, um, a war that still has not ended after 72 years, um, continued to live within my father um, and his mental state. Um, this lack of closure um, impacted his mental health. And he heard, he actually, um, one of the things that he suffered from was auditory hallucinations, where he heard voices of his superiors telling him where to go. And so he would, when he had his episodes, I remember being in the car and he would drive in very, you know, different, we're supposed to go home and he wouldn't go home and he would hear voices. And it was a very scary uh, experience that was unfortunately too often. <clears throat> experienced um, compounded onto that historical trauma of war um, and the stigma of mental illness my family could not talk about this with my with others because there is a there still continues to be a stigma um, in a culture that has um, that is a saving face culture and so um, when my father's sister, invited us to come to America in 1980. And in 1980, Korea was under um, unelected military dictatorship of Chun Doo-wan. I remember curfews when I was seven and eight years old. And, um, and so during this time of political um, uncertainty, we came with a hope to start anew to live the American dream and to be grateful to start over. But this fracture and this trauma that we have had from our past um, doesn't go away at the borders. This trauma we carry to this new country, a country with new vision, but not knowing that there was a nightmare that was awaiting for us in this country. So this kind of leads me to the second question of what are the hauntings that we encountered here in Los Angeles? Um, for, my, for my family, um, the issue of racism um, was big, right? In fact, well, oftentimes people would say, who are you or what are you? Um, they would, you know, kids would tease and they would try to say, you're Chinese, you know, you Chinese, and I would say, I'm not Chinese, <laughs> I'm not Japanese. And this question of what are you persisted with me. Um, people didn't know how to categorize me and dismiss me and dis dismiss my history and the culture that I, were, I came from. Not knowing um, kind of where I came from, people would say, go back to your country, not knowing the history of war. And in fact, if I could talk to those people again, I would say, well, I came, um, I am here because you were there. Um, and this weight of being a child of an immigrant um, stayed with me, this code with switching, the in-between worlds, being in both, but never fully belonging into one. And so you kind of have to grow up early and hold on to not only the weight of the emotional and mental stress that you're going through, but also the mental and emotional stress that your parents are going through. Um, and so I won't tell my parents about my problems because I just need to do right and to be that model minority and to live and be successful and do the right things. Um, and I did, you know, I was active at school. I went to the right schools. And then when I was a sophomore in college, um, the 1992 Saigu event erupted and everything was a mess. Um, there was so much confusion. Some of you may have seen pictures of um, Korean roofmen on top of buildings holding guns. And it was really difficult to understand what was going on. I think now in hindsight, I understand what was really happening. Um, Notice that my just like my father, many of those elders who are now elders or may have passed away um, had their ghosts and they had they knew how to use guns because they all were trained to be soldiers. 
and when their livelihood, everything that they lived for, all the sacrifices that they've made to come here was endangered. Um, their fight mode really activated. And my father as well, our store was on the corner of Vermont and Hollywood, quite away from South Central, but my father somehow got a gun and he came to, went to the rooftop and was trying to protect us, recognizing again, this is when he was having his episodes. And so this was a very scary time. My mother passed away just a few years ago. And so again, my fear, wanting to protect my father um, also activated and it was a difficult time. My best friend had a store um, my, her parents had a store on Olympic and Western, um, which was very, very different from where I was. Um, it was a real war zone where she was, whereas, um, there was no protection by the police. Um, but for where I, where my parents had of their store near Hollywood and Vermont, it was protected because there were hospitals. And so our stories are very, very different. And the only lifeline where we could really understand what was happening was through Korea, Radio Korea. Um, they were telling the stories of what was really happening. Um, and that was the lifeline of what that is a story that was not being told um, in the media. And so we recognize quickly that we need to tell our stories. We need to um, speak up and connect in ways that um, we were unable to in the past. I could go on, but I'm just going to shift so that you can hear stories from different people and maybe I'll come back to add to my story as well. Um, I'd like to invite David to share his story. Thank you, Sue. And um, sorry to hear that uh, you had to be the defender of your dad, probably in more ways than, than one. Um, the ghosts, the, first of all, I'd like to talk about the ghosts of Christianity. The Saturday after the uprising Saigu subsided, I drove to Los Angeles. I, I'm, I've been living in Santa Barbara all these years, but I drove to Los Angeles to meet with a group of pastors, mostly African-American, at uh, West Angeles Church on Crenshaw Boulevard. There were about 150 pastors there who gathered with the intent to demand accountability from the chief of police and the LAPD. Just a few days after that, I was invited to another gathering of pastors here in Santa Barbara. All of them were white. And to my dismay, I discovered that the reason we were there for this prayer meeting was to reinforce our care and support for law enforcement. And Needless, needless to say, my experience with local police was profoundly different than theirs. And this ghost of false Christianity is very active in this moment in our shared zeitgeist. Um, you know, this oppressive, um, pro-oppression kind of a ghost is, is very present among us. The second ghost is the ghost of forgetting. Um, well over a decade after the uprising, I have a friend who had a friend that was part of the rescue team, if you want to call it that. You may remember the name Reginald Denny. He was uh, there were four black men that were pummeling him and torturing him. Basically, he was a truck driver who was pulled out of his truck and viciously beaten. But then there were three other people um, that uh, came and brought aid to Reginald Denny. 
um, maybe saving his life. And one of them was a woman by the name of Lee, Lee Yule. And I found her through another friend and I invited her to come speak to our churches. And at that time, we were between facilities and we were meeting at Westmont College, a Christian college not far from here. And it just so happened that that was one of the Sundays that Lee was with me. And also a number of the students attended that uh, church service that we had there. And the mood in the room um, was, they were, they were so resistant. And it occurred to me 20 years later, some of them probably don't even know about Rodney King and the uprising, uh, this, this gathering of young white college students. And I felt responsible. I felt like I had been irresponsible by exposing Lee to that environment because she was still suffering from PTSD, you know, um, you know, all of those years later. The thing is, is that before I took Lee to Westmont, I took her to another church that at that time I was leading in Oxnard, which was predominantly black and brown, and they celebrated her presence. So again, that, that too is not just the ghost of forgetting, but also the ghost of false Christianity on display. And my, my, my final ghost that I'll introduce to you, you two um, tonight, um, on July 7th, just six years ago, almost six years ago, 2016, I was sitting in this room where I am right now at my computer, and there's a television in the background. And on my TV, there was coverage of a sniper in Dallas. Earlier that same week, we had seen two African-American men killed by police on camera, uh, Philando Castile and Alton Sterling. And it was their deaths that raised tensions around the country. And if that were not enough, this tense situation was now playing out on CNN because there was a Black Lives Matter protest going on and the officers showed up because um, there was a report of a black man who was shooting, a shooter, active shooter. And um, this, man, th this man actually ended up killing some of those police officers. And later we would find out from police chief David Brown that this man was upset about Black Lives Matter. And he said that he was upset about the recent shootings, police shootings. The suspect said he was upset at white people. And the suspect stated he wanted to kill white people, especially white officers. Now, while the reported shootout, I'm looking at my TV, and while the shootout was still underway, a text message appears on my computer screen. My son, Jared, asked me, Dad, is there a war between Black people and police? And my eyes were al already clouded with tears when I typed, stay safe, son. The reason I was so emotional is because this same son, Jared, 25 years earlier as a six-year-old, walked into our living room to see me watching television coverage of Rodney King being brutally beaten by the police in LA. And little Jared looked at me and asked, Daddy, are they going to do that to you? So then a quarter of a century later, and it was highly questionable to me whether the world I was giving my children would be better than the one I inherited. And I cried very hard that night. I cried so hard I I got a migraine and got no sleep. Thank you all for listening. Oh, well, finally, I will say this, that if there's anything that I draw from the experience, it is to affirm that bumper sticker many of you have seen that says subvert the dominant 
paradigm um, because uh, the dominant paradigm is absurd, but it has become so normalized that we accept it. But I'm living passionately to subvert it. Thank you all. Daniela. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend David. That was powerful. I I am coming into the story a little bit later. Um, I my family and I migrated to the US in 1994. Um, and I grew up here in Los Angeles, um, born in Trujillo, Peru. Uh, I was three years old um, at the time when we came over, and um, we carried ghosts. I later came to to know intimately the ghosts that my parents carried, um, and the ways in which they were fed um, with the ghosts that we encountered here on this landscape. Um, we arrived thinking that there would be um, a safety net in place, um, but we found what could probably only be called as maybe a human trafficking trap um, that led to us entering this country illegally. Um, and in that process, we, we came into contact with uh, the haunting of, of criminalization, of being illegal in this country for several years. Um, and similarly putting us in contact with the haunting presence of, of police and the ways that our bodies were being criminalized, uh, quickly disrupting uh, the illusion of the American dream, uh, the illusion that we could escape financial crisis um, and that this dream was accessible to people that looked like us. And so in the midst of that, I, I parallel a lot of the experiences that, that Sue has, has highlighted, the sense of displacement and not being the neither here nor there, um, the, the existing in the in between, um, and, as I, and as I think about ghosts um, that we brought with us, I um, I think I want to highlight uh, my mom. Uh, we we often joke that uh, if there was a zombie apocalypse, Mama Patty, who's now Grandma, Mommy would survive. <laughs> If there was anybody that was going to survive that incident, it would be mom because she is scrappy and knows how to survive. And and um, it's only recently that we've engaged in some conversations where she revealed to me that um, so much of the abuse and, and, and some of the, the, the difficulties of her childhood, um, she's come to realize, uh, came from... Uh, recognizing that her father and his siblings lost their parents at a very young age. And so when they were being brought up, there was, um, there was this weight of being able to know how to survive should anything happen. And that was, in, that was with my grandfather and my grandmother who, who experienced loss of parents um, at early ages. And, and she grappled with it much later in life, but I, I even just, Reckoning with that story and the way that we um, encountered uh, the Los Angeles landscape and the ways that she um, immediately switched gears into helping us survive this space, um, uh, we're certainly informed by those ghosts and those hauntings, um, but that in, in so many ways did enable us to to survive, to eventually obtain citizenship in this country. Um, I think that one of the things that I experienced growing up in Los Angeles was there's there's really so much diversity here. There's really so there are really so many cultures, um, and uh, and those of us that live in in communities um, that maybe aren't quite as suburban don't necessarily encounter um, racism in some of the more traditional overt ways that we've heard about in history. Um, but we, 
we enter the space and, and quickly learn to navigate um, how we are being read, um, which groups congregate together and which groups don't. Um, that, that segregation is, is ever present in, in schools and, um, and in our cities. And, uh, but we've, but at the same time, there's, there's such a convergence of these cultures as well. And so sometimes there's almost the illusion that uh, there's a sense of, of where, where does the right racism lie and, and where are we post-racial or are we not, which we certainly are not. Um, uh, but I think that it, it highlights, it's just experienced differently and we may not have the language for it right away, but um, I think it highlights and this, and this ties back to, um, well, capitalism just at the very inception, but we're put in competition with each other, right? Um, since the very inception of this country, uh, there's this commodification that happens with, with bodies of color, with black bodies, um, uh, brown bodies, migrant bodies, uh, and so we come to see our, we come to understand ourselves um, and value ourselves in terms of labor and productivity and, and profitability, and and um, and it and it gets convoluted and it gets messy because suddenly we're caught in in this in the midst of meritocracy. And and if I have access to those resources and suddenly you're claiming those resources, then I'm losing power. And and so much of the strife that happens and the tension that happens. Um, occurs because we're looking at the power differential um, amongst ourselves. Um, and that is the way that the system works. Um, it is subversive and, and we don't think to look. Sometimes it is so distracting, it is so overwhelming and it is so traumatic and, and we harm ourselves in the process that we don't see, um, we don't see the ways in which white supremacy is sometimes gaslighting us. Well, it's always gaslighting us. Um, and so that, that is sort of the, the, the context in which I come to understand Saigu, um, the LA uprising, um, as I think about our communities and how we move forward. Um, I think about how do we find ourselves um, by facing these hauntings? Uh, how do we hold our ghosts? How do we sometimes care for them? How do we release some of them? And how do we make, in the midst of that, make space and carve out space for, for us to grow, um, to find ourselves and, 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 and find a reason to, to feed and nurture instead our joy, um, nurture instead a whole different set of things and tap into the things, the positive things that survived. I, I, believe that there are knowledges and technologies that were transposed and hidden in the realm of the spiritual, the same way that the ghosts and the hauntings that happen of, and the weight of everything that, that, that we carry, I think, um, I think we, we do well to remember that what of the spirits of resistance but of the spirits of resilience, the spirits of, of courage, of, of a good sense of humor, of, of transformation. Um, how, do we, how do we free ourselves um, and confront our ghosts just long enough to find those? Because I, I truly believe that we, we hid so much more in the realm of the spiritual than sometimes we're confronted with. And, and we move forward, um, in recognition that our liberation is bound together. And I think that doing that just might just mean working outside of the existing framework um, that we have in society and envisioning something new.